This is a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Church Street United Methodist Church proudly presents Rejoice. Good morning and welcome to Rejoice, the weekly devotional program brought to you by Church Street United Methodist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. My name is Andy Ferguson and I'm pleased to be one of the pastors at Church Street Church. In 1975, fresh out of seminary, I was appointed to my first churches in Carroll County, Virginia. One day I went to the county courthouse at Hillsville. I was surprised to see the marks of bullets in the front wall of the courthouse. I assumed there had been a recent shootout. Why, was it, why, why wasn't this in the news? Well, actually the shootout had taken place in the 1920s. A couple of locally notorious outlaws had been arrested and tried for their crimes. When it came time for the sentencing, they were in the courtroom standing before the judge, of course. He had no sooner pronounced the sentence than the uncle of one of the outlaws pulled out several guns and started shooting. They shot their way out of the courtroom, across the front lawn of the courthouse, and then took off for Fancy Gap. Well, the outlaws went to the home of a relative at Fancy Gap. The sheriff and a posse soon arrived and surrounded the place. It must have been quite a sight. The posse surrounded the house. Guns were ready. Then the sheriff called for the outlaws to surrender. And then without a single shot being fired, the outlaws came out of the house and surrendered peacefully. Now, why did they give up so quickly after all the shooting back at the courthouse? According to the story I heard, after all they had done in making their escape, they knew that the sheriff had the right to arrest them and send them to prison. So they put down their guns and came out. The bullet holes I saw 50 years later had never been covered over. I suppose they were left as a reminder of what had happened that day. We're going to read a, a parable of Jesus with the message that God has a right to hold us accountable for our actions and our lives too. We usually pass over that message without giving it much thought. Popular theology tells us that God is such a pushover that God will forgive endlessly to the point that we cannot imagine God actually holding us accountable for anything. Well, there are statements from Jesus in which he makes the point that God does hold us accountable and will hold us accountable. You might say that God is loving, but God is neither stupid nor blind. How we respond to the gospel finally matters. How we live in response to the gospel finally matters. We are accountable before God. We're going to read from Luke chapter 20 this morning. I invite you to get your Bible so you can read along with me. As you are finding your Bible, let's listen as our parish adult choir sings for us, The Better Me from Requiem. Our soloist will be Daniel Varnell.
Now take your Bible and we're going to read from Luke chapter 20, beginning with verse 9. Jesus began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and leased it to tenants and went to another country for a long time. When the season came, he sent a slave to the tenants in order that they might give him his share of the produce of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Next he sent another slave, that one also they beat and insulted and sent away empty-handed. And he still sent a third, this one also they wounded and threw out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son, perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they discussed it among themselves and said, this is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, the people said, Heaven forbid. But he looked at them and said, What does this text mean? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the scribes and the chief priests realized that he had told this parable against them, they wanted to lay hands on him at that very hour, but they feared the people. God's word for God's people. Would you pray with me? Lord, let this word, this story, this parable of Jesus become for us the living word by which our lives are given direction and hope, by which we are given wisdom, the wisdom of God for living. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. This rich parable can be read in several ways. First, we can read it as an update of an Old Testament passage, Isaiah chapter 5. Second, we can read it by itself from beginning to the end. And thirdly, we can read it by itself from the ends to the middle. So while the parable from Luke is still fresh in your mind, I want to re read the similar passage from Isaiah chapter 5. This is called the, the Song of the Unfruitful Vineyard. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a, a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah Judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed. It shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. The passages begin in much the same way. The problem of the wicked tenants is the same in both. The difference begins early, however, in the way Isaiah and then Jesus in Luke set out to solve the problem presented by the wicked tenants. In Isaiah, the solution to the tenants comes in the form of a courtroom. God will present his case against the wicked tenants. Israel is called to sit in judgment. The edge in this courtroom scene is that Israel is the wicked tenant. Passing judgment, they will pass judgment on themselves. Now, if we read the parable from Luke chapter 20, from beginning to end, then we'll focus on the actions of the, of the tenants from beginning to end. An, older, an owner builds a vineyard and leases it to tenants. He goes away to another country for a long time. At the time of the harvest, the owner sends a servant to collect his share of the rent. The tenants beat servant number one. The owner sends servant number two, same result. Then he sends servant number three, same thing. And then the owner sends his son, hoping they will respect his son. But instead of respect, the wicked, wicked tenants kill the son, hoping that the old man will die and leave the vineyard abandoned. 
And then Jesus asks, what do you think the owner will do? Well, of course, he'll come and clean out the whole lot of them. And then he will rent the vineyard to better tenants who will care for it. And finally, Matthew tells us that Jesus said directly to the chief priest and the elders with everyone listening, and he looked at them and said, what then does this text mean? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. And the scripture says that when the scribes and the chief priest realized he had told this parable against them, they wanted to lay hands on him at that very hour, but they feared the people. Thus, the events leading to the cross have begun. Reading the parable for the ending points us to the wicked tenants who do not deserve the vineyard. The connection with the chief priest and the elders is obvious. They are angry. Reading the parable this way calls up our sense of, of justice. These tenants had a job. They refused to keep their end of the bargain they made with the owner. They were clearly in the wrong. Whether we like the boss or not, when we agree to do a job, we all share the conviction that we ought to do our part or quit and go away. The tenants, whether we identify with them or not, are in the wrong. We all share the sense of justice about the matter. Actually, Jesus' parable is more difficult to swallow than that. In the days of Jesus, that area of Galilee was the breadbasket for the whole region. Traveling from Jerusalem north into Galilee is to see the world turn from brown to green. Several years ago, we traveled by bus from Egypt through Israel and up into Galilee. Land along the Nile River was green and very productive. From there across the Sinai Peninsula and then through Israel, the land was desert brown until we reached Galilee. In the days of Jesus, Galilee was largely owned by foreign investors who then leased the land back to local tenant farmers. It was an economic system designed to keep the locals poor and landless. It was a system that took the best produce of Galilee and exported it to the cities for better prices. For Jesus to tell a story about a landowner in Galilee would call up memories of this oppressive economic system. As the parable opens, the landowner does not have anyone's sympathy. Furthermore, you can imagine the local people of Galilee struggling under the economic system, wondering just how strongly those foreign owners want to keep their property. They live a long way off. What would they care if they lost this? Maybe if we beat a few of their bill collectors, they'll get the message. We don't want them around here. It was a daydream that many likely considered, but few were wicked enough to follow. As the parable continues, Jesus teases his listeners to reach down to their own sense of justice. Yes, the economic system that leaves the outside owners rich and the people of the land in poverty is harsh. But we did agree, and so we must keep our agreement. Grudgingly, they would finally stand with the owner against the wicked tenants. In this sense, the, uh, the parable is about accountability. Like the landowner, God has a right to expect something of those whom God has blessed. Have you kept the Ten Commandments? Have you loved your neighbor? Have you kept yourself clean? Have you paid your taxes? Have you loved the Lord your God with heart, soul, mind, and strength? Christians who live under God's blessings every day should not hide behind God's love to do any old thing we like. God has expectations of us, and we have expectations of ourselves. There's a third way to read this parable. We can read it by itself from the ends to the middle. Recall the parable. The owner sent three sets of servants to collect what was due, and when each was met with abuse and violence, the owner had to decide what to do. Now we expect that the owner will respond with overwhelming violence of his own. As the parable says, he will come and destroy those tenants. The word destroy is a strong term. But there in the middle, Jesus tells us of an owner who will do the unexpected. He will send his beloved son confident that they will respect the son. The owner who has every right to respond with destruction against those tenants makes a conscious choice 
to respond with the gift of his beloved son. We hear this and recoil at the naivete of the idea. Either the owner is very stupid or the owner is great of heart. Which do you see? Kenneth Bailey says of this decision, the owner has the right to contact the authorities who at his request will send a heavily armed company of soldiers to storm the vineyard, arrest the violent men who have mistreated the servants and bring them to justice. The abusing of his servants is an insult to his person and he is expected indeed honor bound to deal with the matter. No anger is mentioned, but it is assumed. The question is, what will he do with the anger generated by the injustice he and his servants have suffered? There are plenty of examples from inside and outside the Bible of what leaders have chosen to do in the face of rebellion. When the people of earth lived in wanton sinfulness, God sent a flood to wash away all the sinners and all the results of their sin, the story of Noah and the ark. When Pharaoh would not let Israel go to freedom, God sent 10 plagues to punish them and to change his mind. Disobedience led to punishment. When Israel would not live according to the commandments of God, war and eventual exile was the result. Disobedience led to exile. And when the American South seceded from the Union over slavery and the economic system that came with it, Abraham Lincoln led the Civil War that forced them back into the Union rebellion was met with violence. Violence and treachery most often gets violent punishment in response. The owner of the vineyard must decide what he will do with the anger generated by this injustice. Will he allow his enemies to dictate the nature of his response? But is further violence the only answer? You can almost sense a painful pause in the middle of the parable as the owner thinks about what he must do. And now the parable shows us something most unexpected. The owner in the face of repeated insult and injury decides that the way to solve this is to send his son, even at the risk that they will kill him. To his hearer's surprise, the son is sent to the vineyard alone and unarmed. The son goes with no escort to meet the vicious men who are tensely awaiting his father's response to their latest outrage. What kind of risky, humiliating thinking is this from the owner? But more, is this, is this what God is like? And does this show us something about the cross? I think it does. The cross of Jesus is how God straightens things out. God might have chosen to punish all our sins and wickedness, but God chose the cross. As someone said, he chose the nails. This is how God straightens things out. And that is what the noble owner of the vineyard was doing when he sent his son to the wicked tenants. He was trying to fan the dying embers of the tenant's sense of honor. That is what God did when he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for the world. God was and still is trying to fan the dying embers of a scoundrel's sense of honor. In Jesus, God took his righteous anger at rebellious humanity and chose to respond with grace. And when you get it, be prepared to find your hardened heart softened. This kind of love is that moving. We should go back to the Ten Commandments. They point us toward the kingdom of God. They're intended for our health and well-being. They remind us where we fall short and where we are frankly rebellious against the will and the intention of God. So what should God do when we fall short? What should God do when we break the Ten Commandments in our deeds and in our hearts? What should God do when we are rebellious? God has every right to respond with punishment. And we know how punishment works. Our prisons, our divorce courts, our personnel files are filled with the results of punishments. But as Jesus teaches in this parable of a noble vineyard owner, and as Jesus demonstra demonstrates through the broken bread and his death on the cross, God chooses grace. Grace in the hope that when we encounter costly grace, we will respond with honor and loyalty and love. So think about it. 
We all know what to expect when people are cruel or mean. We expect the world and God alike to respond with punishment. What is the logic behind God's incredible decision to respond to the world's cruelty with the gift of God's own Son? How does that work? It is no wonder that the church stands before this parable and declares that God has done something new in Jesus Christ. It is no wonder that the church proclaims that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. Think about that. Hold that in your hands. Turn it in your mind until you too can understand that the cross is something different. As we reflect on this great act of self-giving on how we will respond, let us listen as our parish treble choir sings, My Song is Love Unknown. Thank you. As we come to the end of our time together this morning, I want to invite you to join us for worship at Church Street United Methodist Church. Our services are on Sunday morning at 8.30 and 11 a.m. in the nave. It is a beautiful place. It is a beautiful hour for us to gather in God's presence for worship. Also, I invite you to our midweek communion that happens on Wednesday at noon in the chapel. Again, in the middle of the week, what a wonderful opportunity to take the break and come and join with others as we kneel in the presence of God to receive the bread and the cup. One other special invitation I have for this evening, this tonight, this Sunday night, is that at 9 p.m., and that's a little bit later than usual, but at 9 p.m. in the nave, there will be a service of Compline. It is a contemplative service of reflection as we close the day. Uh, some people have called the service of Compline uh, singing good night to God because as we gather there in the, in the, the, the half light or the, the near darkness, we will listen to the voices as they sing to us, sing to us the, the psalms, sing to us of God's praises, and then finally lead us into the close of the evening. We invite you to come and to be a part of this, this first time for us service uh, and look forward to, to experiencing this in the nave there at Church Street. Well, I'm Andy Ferguson. 
pastor at Church Street United Methodist Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. I thank you for letting me share this devotional time with you in your home. And now as I go, my wish for you, that you might live each day like out of the corner of your eye, you have just caught sight of God and realize that God is headed your way. Members and friends of Church Street United Methodist Church, your downtown church at the corner of Henley and Main, would like to thank you for joining Rejoice. Please send us your comments and suggestions, and be sure to tune in next Sunday at this same time for Rejoice.